Okay. Is the microphone okay? All right, so then uh, let's, let's move on then to the theory. So as I said, let's start then with section one, which is uh, closed, which I call closed optomechanics. And uh, here by close, it has to do with uh, the difference with open quantum systems, okay? You had already lectures about open quantum systems which means a system coupled to the environment. Uh, here now I refer to the system with, uh, that is isolated, still not coupled to the environment, just to describe the so-called coherent dynamics, okay? So recall that our, uh, symbolically, our optomechanical system, I will use this image again, this cavity with a movable mirror, okay? And in quantum physics, whenever we want to describe the system, we need to identify well the degrees of freedom that the system has and the potential interaction. And here, basically for us now, this big massive uh, system and big uh, will be uh, analyzed as basically the coupling between one degree of freedom associated to the cavity, which I call it cavity mode. And recall that in quantum optics we use mode the word mode, in a sense, can be translated to a single harmonic oscillator, okay? Any mode is an, uh, an harmonic oscillator, basically. So here there will be one harmonic oscillator associated to the cavity. The electro and cavity here, I mean the electromagnetic field resonator. And then one mechanical mode. Okay, the excitations of the cavity mode, we will call them photon. The excitations of the mechanical mode, we will call them phonon, okay? So basically, there is a cavity mode, a mechanical mode, and then there is the interaction between the two. Okay, so that's the idea. So you will see that now we will suddenly model this uh, in a very rather looking simple uh, way, but actually it contains and it is able to describe very well the physics of the system. So let us then <coughs> focus first on the mechanical mode. Okay, and this is nothing else but a quantum harmonic oscillator. Okay, let us focus on the mechanical mode. So namely this motion here of this mirror. Okay, so basically you see already from the picture that here what I I'm interested is in the one dimensional motion of this mirror along the axis X, okay, which is vibrating. So and hence we can use uh, the model of or, or the description of a one dimensional quantum harmonic oscillator. And recall that the Hamiltonian of a quantum harmonic oscillator is this one. Now I write quantum mechanically already with the operators P and X, which fulfill the following commutation rule. And this Hamiltonian introduces two, new, two parameters. One is the mass of the oscillator, which is relevant, and the other is the resonance frequency of the oscillator, omega m, okay? And <coughs> in the quantum harmonic oscillator, we always write, the, we can write, we can make a change of variables, we can write x and p in terms of creation and, and annihilation operators in the following form, and this is, I know this might be very basic for some of you, but we need to review it because what appears here is actually super relevant for optomechanics, which is this parameter here, recall. <coughs> okay, this is just a change of variables where now this creation and relation operation operators fulfill the commutation rule 
B, B daga equal to 1. Okay, and I call B for the mechanical motion because I will use A for the cavity degree of freedom. And here it has appeared a, a, param a value here that is very, very important. This is a length, it's a length scale. We call it in optomechanics the zero point motion. And I write it here. The zero point motion. X zero, which is the square root of H two mass and omega M. This is the typical length scale that appears in the quantum harmonic oscillator which as a theoretical physicist, I think it's very useful to remember, because it's very good. Then, why is this important? Because now, as I said in the introduction, the main feature of optomechanics is that we deal with very large masses. Very large masses here will mean that this, is, this parameter will be way smaller than for a single atom. So let us put actually some numbers to that. So if we take, uh, if we write uh, the mass written as n times an atomic mass unit. Recall that an atomic mass unit is 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. And we consider for a reference a mechanical frequency that I didn't mention yet, but typical frequencies for optomechanics are of the order of megahertz. So the, mecha so the mechanical motion is typically oscillating at megahertz frequencies. Okay, so it makes uh, one million uh, oscillations in a second. Uh, if we plug this number and this number here, well, we use the value of the h-bar, we will get that this x0 is of the order of 71 divided the square root of n, where n is the number of atomic mass units the mass contains, times 10 to the minus 9 meters. And this is actually, it should, it's, use, it's very good to, to think about these numbers so that you have a mental picture of the system. So this number tells us uh, that if the mass would be comparable to a single atom, and you would take this atom, place it in harmonic potential of frequency 1 megahertz, and for instance, you would be able to cool the motion to the ground state, the, the atom would fluctuate according to quantum fluctuations in a length scale given of around 70 nanometers, which is actually pretty impressive because if you recall, the size of an atom is 0 0.1 nanometer, more or less. So an atom in the quantum motion or ground state in a typical harmonic potential is delocalized due to quantum fluctuations over length scales of the order of 100 times its size. Okay? So it's really like a, like a cloud, really. However, if the object is much more massive, for instance, I talked before about ends that could be from 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 19, okay, you, you decrease this by a lot. Okay? In particular, if you take the typical masses that you have in optomechanics, say 10 to the 12, then you reduce this by six orders of magnitude. So you go to length scales of the order of 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 13, even more. So basically, the quantum fluctuations of this big object is way smaller than the size of an atom, com even comparable to the nuclei of an atom. Okay? This is important, because this length scale appears a lot. OK? So this, this parameter is actually very relevant. It will appear in all the discussion. <coughs> so as I said before, recall that if you would have such an harmonic potential and you would cool to the ground state, recall that the ground state of an harmonic potential is a Gaussian wave function, and this size here is comparable to, is comparable to the zero-point motion. Okay? So that's the idea. The center of mass of this massive object, if you cool it to the ground state of this harmonic potential, will have a size given by the zero point motion. All right. Good. So then using this, uh, this change of variables, you know well that then the Hamiltonian of the harmonic oscillator is just can be written as 
as this, up to uh, constant shifts that I can always shift away. Okay. And uh, recall that now in the quantum harmonic oscillator there are different relevant uh, families of states. Ones are the so-called Fox states, which are the eigenstates of B dagger B, that in a sense counts how many excitations do I have. Okay, so the Fox states are defined as being the eigenstates of this operator, B dagger B, namely the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian H. So these are energy eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And once you implement this change of variables, there is this nice kind of algebra with these operators B. So the energy eigenstates are Fox states, eigenstates of B dagger B, and they are, and if you apply B dagger to n, you just increase n by one with a prefactor square root of n plus one. If you apply b, you decrease with a square root of n. Okay. <coughs> and out of these Fox states, there is one that is particularly relevant, which is the ground state, which is defined as the state that is annihilated by b. Okay, this is the ground state. And in optomechanics, there have been already experiments done where the mechanical motion of these huge objects is cooled down so much that they reach the ground state. Okay? So that they really remove all the thermal excitation so that it's in a very nice ground state of an harmonic oscillator. And this for an object so large as the ones I was saying before. So, and in the quantum ground state, what has that, the, as I said before, the fluctuations of x of the motion is precisely given by the zero point motion square. Okay? So that's why this length scale is important. So they have, I, I repeat that, they have done experiments where they slow down the motion of a big object that you can see almost with your bare eye, such that the fluctuations of the center of mass are of the order of x0, which is of the order of 10 to the minus 14 meters. So basically, this thing is only moving due to quantum fluctuations. Okay, So this is very impressive, of course. Sometimes we call, we call these quantum fluctuations the fact that the center of mass is not uh, in, a, in a given position in a deterministic way. We call that the center of mass is delocalized. It's, you know, it, it, it suffers quantum delocalization. So, <coughs> so this is the delocalization distance. Delocalization distance. of the mechanical mode. Okay, quantum delocalization distance of the mechanical mode. And then you see something that is happening because of this scaling, you see that it goes like one over square root of the mass. It does imply that the more massive, the more massive the object, Uh, the more localized, the more localized it is in the ground state. And this is an important uh, relevant comment that uh, brings some point for discussion because as you saw in the motivation, I was saying, hey, optomechanics is great. You could observe quantum uh, physics with very macroscopic objects. And that's true. But at the same time, uh, looking at this scaling, it also tells us that the more massive it is, 
the more uh, tiny these quantum features will be, because for instance, the quantum fluctuations will go to really, really small values. Okay? So, hence, if you want, one could think that this is another important relevant, not only if the system can be brought to the quantum regime, but also what is the size of this uh, quantum, uh, quantum effects, the size of this quantum, for instance, the quantum delocalization distance. Okay? And indeed, uh, there is some research also on investigating how, what can you do once you are in this quantum regime where the fluctuations are small, what can you do to increase these fluctuations to even larger scales, okay? So ideally, we would like to do experiments where we place one of these massive objects at two locations in space which are really separate, okay? Like one, the mass is in this room and in another room. Okay, this would be a very large localization distance over 20 meters. Once we are in the inside the harmonic oscillator, all the land scales are of that size. So when we talk about superpositions, they would have of that size. So it is, we will not have time to enter, but it is a relevant question to think how to uh, increase this land scale over microscopic scales, or whether this is actually relevant for some addressing some of the fundamental questions I, I mentioned in motivation A and so on, okay? That's uh, something to, to, to take into account. Good, so this is regarding, you see, we have introduced now the Fox states, and in particular, one Fox state, the ground state, which is very relevant in the context of optomechanics. Another type of state that is also very important is the so-called thermal state. The thermal state of a quantum harmonic oscillator is defined as the density matrix rho, which you obtain by taking the exponential of minus beta times h bar and dividing by, its tr by the trace of such operators such that the trace of the density matrix is one, where beta is as always one over kBT. Okay, so that's the definition of a thermal state. Basically, a thermal state depends on uh, on a Hamiltonian H and some parameter that we call temperature. This defines a thermal state. If you take this, the Hamiltonian to be this one, then, uh, okay, that's the thermal state of the quantum harmonic oscillator. <coughs> it basically depends on two parameters, in temperature and in the frequency, omega m. And for instance, something relevant from this state is that if you calculate the mean number of excitations in the thermal state, which quantum mechanically we would calculate as the trace of rho times B dagger B, then uh, this is nothing else but the Bose-Einstein occupation number this famous occupation number one divided exponential of beta h bar omega minus one. Okay? And recall what this is telling us. So this is telling that if temperature is way, way larger, so if, if kBT is way larger than h bar omega m, then this exponent is huge, so the denominator is huge, uh, sorry, uh, no, the opposite. So uh, this exponent, it goes to basically zero. So e to the zero is one. So you have one minus one, zero, one divided by zero, infinite. So you, if this is much in the, th for a very high temperature, n bar basically goes to infinity. So there is a lot of excitations on the oscillator. Whereas if kBT is smaller than h bar omega, then n bar is very close to zero, okay? And this is actually super, uh, very relevant to recall that, that if you have a quantum harmonic oscillator in a thermal state, if the temperature is smaller than uh, omega m, the thermal state will be basically empty, will be in the ground state. Whereas if the thermal state has a temperature T larger than omega M, then it will be very occupied, okay? This is kind of, kind of basic maybe, but actually in optomechanics will be very relevant in a second. 
Okay. So I will I will allude to this later in the lecture, so keep this in mind. Okay. This comment. So then also something to recall from a thermal state. If you calculate what is the probability that if I, I take a thermal state and I measure how many excitations do I have, I obtain the value of n, such probability, which quantum mechanically you calculate by taking this bracket from the thermal state. This is just given by this expression. Okay, don't confuse the n bars with the n. n bar is the thermal mean number occupation. N is the number associated to the probability you are asking for, okay? To obtain N excitations. And also, you calculate what is the variance on the number of excitations for a thermal state, which is calculated like that. Then, This goes like this, n bar square plus n bar, okay? <clears throat> so for, very, for n bars larger than one, it goes as n bar, so the fluctuations, so if you have a thermal state, you measure how many excitations do I have, the fluctuations are of the order of the mean value for large n bar. For n bars smaller than one, the fluctuations go as a square root of n, because then it dominates this part. Anyways, but perhaps the useful, uh, think of a thermal state is that I can always write the thermal state in the Fock basis. <clears throat> and in the Fock basis, it has this form, which is very useful to remember. There is some prefactor. But the important thing is that the thermal state in the Fock basis, it is diagonal. Okay, a thermal state in the Fock basis only has diagonal terms. There are no correlations between Fock states. And why it is relevant? Because if I ask you now to calculate what is the mean value of the position for a quantum harmonic oscillator in a thermal state, you should be able to answer that immediately. So what is the mean value of, uh, of x? Uh, what is the mean value of x for a thermal state? It should be 0, because when you make the bracket, you will decrease with the b's or b daggers is n, and when you do the trace, it gives a zero. Okay, or for the quantum electromagnetic field, the, the mean value of the electric field in the thermal state is zero. Okay, it's just the fluctuations that are huge. Good. So this was to introduce the thermal state. Then uh, another important state of the quantum harmonic oscillator is the so-called coherent state. The coherent state is defined as the eigenstate of the annihilation operator. Okay. And since these operators B are not emission, by definition, this alpha, which is the eigenvalue, can be complex. So alpha can, in general, uh, be complex. So it depends on two uh, real numbers, the real part and the imaginary part. Okay? And the coherent state, I recall that can be written in the Fock basis as that. Okay, it's a linear combination in the Fock basis, and you should, of course, Appreciate the difference between this and this. This is a mixed state, which is the density matrix is diagonal in N, whereas the coherent state is a pure state that can be written as a linear combination of Fock states. So this is a coherent superposition. This is a, a classical mixture. Okay. <clears throat> and from the coherent state, there are basically two things or three things that are important. First is that the probability in a coherent state to find n excitations, which you would calculate quantum mechanically as this bracket, just give me this Poisson distribution. OK? 
Okay, this is a Poisson distribution. <coughs> and the mean value of n is just given by alpha square, okay? The modulus alpha square. And these are important for a coherent state. This complex number alpha, the modulus square of this complex number alpha tells you the mean number of phonons, uh, of excitations. Okay, so the mean value of B dagger B. Okay. And for a coherent state, the standard deviation of the number of operators goes as the square root of the mean value. So namely, basically, as the modulus of alpha. To compare the difference also between a thermal and a coherent state, the standard deviation for a coherent state goes like a square root of n, whereas the standard deviation for a thermal state for large n goes as n. Okay, so a thermal state has much larger fluctuations in the number of excitations. Good. Then another property of coherent states is that they are not ortho ortho orthogonal. So namely, if you calculate the bracket between two coherent states of different alpha, this is not just a, a direct delta, but almost, because they decay exponentially with the distance between two points in, in the complex plane. But they are not ortho orthogonal. But they are complete. So they complete the basis in the sense that if you integrate If you integrate the cat bra over all complex plane and divide by pi, this gives you the identity. Okay? That's, that's useful. So coherent states are not orthogonal, but they are complete. They can span all the Hilbert space of the harmonic oscillator. So I need to introduce this because I will use it a lot and I wanted to make sure you all know that and also to introduce some notation. Okay? So I go a bit fast. So that's a coherent state. Interrupt me if you have questions. Then from the coherent state, I can define another type of states, which are very, very fancy, which are the so-called cat states, or Schrodinger cat states, okay, which, depending on the context, uh, we use this name cat state to define all type of different states. In, this, in the context of quantum optics, typically, for cat states, one understands the superposition of two coherent states with opposite phase, namely, you could define a cut state, define as that. You take a coherent state alpha and you make a superposition with a state minus alpha. Okay? And here you allow to include a phase with two particular relevant values, phi equal to zero, which means is the plus superposition, and phi equal to pi, which is the minus superposition what people call an even cat state or an odd cat state. And, uh, yeah. and for instance, just to recall, you, to recall, if you have an even cat state, then this has a superposition of only uh, even number of excitations. Okay, so it will only have a superposition of 0, plus 2, plus 4, plus 6, but not odds. So when you sum a coherent state with a plus, you only get odd number of excitations. That's why it's called an even cut state. When it is odd, then you do the same, but you have here 1, plus three, and so on, okay? Good, okay? <coughs> so how many of you have heard about the Binger function? 
Uh, did you have, sorry? The last one? Yeah, so the prefactor is the same, and then you have one plus three. For the even, yeah? There is a, a typo? Yeah, it's also. Just wanted to recall that you have superposition of odd excitations or even. Very rapidly, so a tool that is very useful in the context of the quantum harmonic oscillator is the so-called Binner function. Okay. And uh, which is defined as follows. I just define it and I discuss a couple of properties, which then allows me to define a concept that appears in optomechanics that is very relevant. So recall that the Binner function is a function that depends on two real numbers, x and p, associated with units of position and momentum. And I obtain it from a density matrix by doing the following strange operation. Okay, so that's the Bigner function. It's defined like that, so definitions are never wrong. So this is just a definition. Uh, and just make sure we understand it. So here we have the density matrix. So for any density matrix, you can calculate the Bigner function. And what you need to do is you take the density matrix, you do this bracket where these states, these are eigenstates of position. These are the eigenstates of the position operator. You just take, take this bracket, then this will be a complex number that depends on x and y. And now uh, you integrate over y, kind of doing a Fourier transform, and then you will get something that depends on x and p. That's it, okay? Why this definition is useful is because it has the following, well, first of all, it's a mapping from any quantum state, you have a bigger function. And this, and this Bigner function, it has the following properties. First of all, uh, the Bigner function is, uh, it can be plotted. So the Bigner function is real. It's real, so it means it can be plotted. Now in a, in a, in a, in a, in a nice uh, three-dimensional plot where I would put, uh, for instance, uh, or a, in a contour plot where I would put x and p, and I will plot here with the color, with a bar, the W, okay? Can be plotted, or in a 3D plot. So f this means that now any quantum state of the harmonic oscillator, you can make, you can have an image, you can have a photo of the state, which is very nice, okay, and very pedagogical. So I urge you to, to actually do that, to have a little code where for all these famous states, you just have an image of the, of the Binger function. It's very useful. Then it has the following important properties. First, it's well normalized. So if you integrate over all phase space, so the, the space of position and momentum, in physics we call it phase space. So if you integrate over all positions and all momentum, the Binger function, defined as it is, it is uh, normalized. It gives you a one. Okay? Then, uh, as I said, it is real, and then there are two super nice properties of the Bigner function, which is that if you integrate a margin, so if you take a marginal of the Bigner function, namely you integrate p, you get a function of x, and this function of x is actually something very physical, it's the probability distribution to find the harmonic oscillator in position x. Okay, that's the marginal. So basically it gives me the probability distribution to find the state rho at position x. And if you take the other marginal, you 
then you, you get the probability distribution to, for the state to have momentum P. Okay? And then this means that if you have this nice three-dimensional plot of the Binger function, where here I have x, I have p, and I have w, and I have some nice th three-dimensional function. If you now just project, project this function into this plane, then you would have some one-dimensional plot, or in this plane, and this is just p of x, and this is p of p. Okay, so the projections onto the screen in the plane PW or XW just give you the probability distribution. So then the whole point is that you might be tempted, tempted to say, hey, I have some function that is real. If I integrate it, it gives me to one. So is this not just a probability distribution? It, it, it is this function not telling me what is the probability to find the particle with position X and position P? Well, point is, if this particle will be classical, yes. But since it is quantum, you know that in quantum mechanics, because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you cannot know X and P uh, with certainty. So a manifestation of that is that this is not a probability distribution because there are some points where it can be negative. So very importantly, the Binger function uh, W can be negative. can be negative, okay? So it is not a probability distribution, it's what is called a quasi-probability distribution. Please. Yeah, yeah, you can calculate. So from the Binger function, since it contains all the same information as rho, any mean value of any observable can be calculated. So basically, if you calculate the mean value of x, you just integrate over phase space w times x. If you want the mean value of uh, p, you multiply by p and you integrate and so on. Does this property uniquely determine that? It, it, it is? Does this uniquely determine? No, 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 no. So that's the point. So if you want to now represent, so but I think, if I understood your question correctly, you are kind of asking how would you obtain the Binger function given the mean value of some observables? And that's, of course, a delicate question because you should do, you should obtain a lot. I will come in a second to that because I will use this question to motivate something. But now, first thing is that W can be negative. And this, it's very nice because it defines now you can make two classes of states of the harmonic oscillator. Harmonic oscillator states for which the Wigner function is at always positive, and quantum harmonic oscillator states for which the Wigner function has points which is negative. And this defines two classes of states. And actually, you can now make a definition. You can say, hey, I define states which have a negative Wigner function. And these states, uh, if you want, in the quantum domain, they have some, uh, they rank a bit higher than the others because uh, not only because they really feature some quantum, very clear quantum features, namely you have now a phase space quasi probability distribution with negative values, but it's also because it's actually not so easy to prepare them, okay? So it just, just makes a definition. And that's why I wanted to introduce the Wigner function because in optomechanics, it is relevant to make experiments where you will prepare the mechanical motion into a state whose Wigner function is negative. And that's if you do that, you, you know, that's a very nice uh, experiment. And only very recently, uh, experimentalists are doing this type of experiments. But also the Wigner function also allows me to define another, uh, a class or divide states into two classes, which are better related to this, div this division between negative and positive, which are the so-called uh, Gaussian states. And I want to define these Gaussian states because they are very important. Okay, so Gaussian states are defined as states whose Wigner function has a Gaussian form, okay, in its more general form. 
So Gaussian states are defined as states whose Wigner function can be written in this very general form. And I think that tomorrow you have lectures about continuous, uh, so quantum information with continuous variables, and I'm sure this concept of Gaussian states will either be introduced or, or, or assume that you know, so it's useful that you see now. So a, Bigner, a Gaussian state is defined in this way, so it has a Wigner function which can be written in its most general form along uh, in this way. Okay, I introduce now everything. Where uh, this R vector contains these coordinates X and P of my Wigner function. Okay, hence S is a matrix. And sorry, or I write it like that. X. And this S matrix is a two per two matrix that contains the following entries. The mean value of x squared, the mean value of p squared, and the mean value of xp plus px. Okay. Wait a second. Please, one second, Tony. So this, then you see this being a function is just defined by that. So given the mean value of x, given the mean value of p, given the mean value of x squared, p squared, and this, so these are five real numbers. Given these five real numbers, I construct this Wigner function, which is Gaussian. And this is the more general form. No, 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 this is the mean value of x squared. I think it's, uh, I should check, but so I, re I remove the mean value here. So. No, no, no. The x is a parameter, is the parameter, the argument of your function. So the mean value only appears here. So basically the Wigner function is centered in phase space in the mean value. Yeah. But the important message is Gaussian states fulfill two things. First, they are positive. By definition, the Wigner function is positive. And second, it only is defined, it's a quantum state that is defined only by five real numbers. The mean value of x, the mean value of p, which is kind of boring because if it's not zero, you just reshift the coordinate axis such that they are zero. So basically, there are only three real numbers that are relevant to define a Gaussian state, which are basically the value of its second moments, x squared, p squared, and xp plus px. Okay? So it's very nice. It's a quantum state that uh, only depends on three real numbers. Non-Gaussian states will depend on potentially an infinite amount of real numbers, all the higher moments. Okay? So Gaussian states are kind of very simple in that sense. So now from the states I've introduced before, uh, we can, I can tell you which ones are Gaussian and which ones are not. So for instance, what do you think? Is a thermal state Gaussian? What do you think? Yes. Thermal state is Gaussian. It only depends on, you could now calculate the three numbers and you have the Gaussian state. It's Gaussian. What about Fox states? Are they Gaussian or not? Huh? Who says it's Gaussian? Okay. So, uh, you are neither uh, perfectly correct nor, perf nor completely wrong because the ground state the ground state of the harmonic, of a, which is a Fox state, is actually Gaussian. Whereas the Fox states with n different from zero are non-Gaussian, and furthermore, basically, non-Gaussian and negative Wigner function is almost a synonymous. There are very few states which are non-Gaussian and positive, okay? So most of the non-Gaussian states are also negative. So Fox states with n equal to one, two, three, four are negative Wigner function non-Gaussian states. But the Fox, the ground state zero is, uh, is Gaussian. Recall also that the ground state, uh, uh, oh, sorry, and the next question, and coherent states, which are pure quantum states, are they Gaussian or non-Gaussian? Huh? Gaussian. You could already guess they are Gaussian because they, are, they only depend on two real numbers, the real part of alpha and the real part of 
in the imaginary part of alpha. So they, they are not so complicated. They are Gaussian, OK? Then we didn't talk here about that, but there are also squeeze states, where you take a coherent state and you reduce one fluctuation, uh, one, uh, one argument really, really tiny. And they, people say, oh, these are very nice quantum states. Squeeze states are also Gaussian. Okay? And also recall that the ground state is very special, because the ground state is basically everything. The ground state is a Fox state with n equal to 0. It's a thermal state of zero temperature, and it is a coherent state of alpha zero. Okay? So ground state is both a thermal state, a Fox state, and a coherent state. So it is Gaussian. Good. <coughs> okay, so I said by words, Gaussian states only depend on three relevant real numbers plus two that depend where they are centered. And examples of Gaussian states are thermal, coherent, and squeezed. Good. All right. This was just a fast introduction to the states of the harmonic quantum oscillator in the context of discussing the mechanical mode. <coughs> that now, let me start the discussion about the cavity mode. I will use all of this. Notation. So the cavity mode, in general, what we mean here is that we always have an electromagnetic field resonator. Let's assume for the drawing point of view to consider an optical one, which is basically the electromagnetic field that you can have in between two mirrors or in a confined space. And, and this dimension is L. OK, and I assume then from these mirrors, these optical resonators, in this cavity scenario, we define the so-called cavity axis, okay, which I use to be x here. Okay. And then the procedure of how you should do this rigorously, and it's done, what one should do is to solve the Maxwell equations inside or the Maxwell equations with these boundary conditions. Maxwell equations with the boundary conditions that, in this position of space, there are uh, perfect mirrors, which means perfectly conducting uh, objects, namely that the transverse electric field on the surface is zero. Okay, then you solve Maxwell equations in the presence of these boundaries, and then you show, one can show that the Maxwell equations in the presence of these boundaries have the same form, or can be written as the same form of as an eigenvalue type of equation, namely that there will be equations or solutions that they will evolve in the Fourier space in a very trivial way. They will be eigenvalues, OK? They will be uh, kind of eigenfunctions uh, of, these, of these equations, which means they just evolve with a single harmonic oscillator just oscillating. Okay? And we call this, each of these solutions modes, electromagnetic field modes. Okay? When we do that, when we solve Maxwell equations in free space, plane waves are already modes, because a plane wave just evolves with a frequency omega t. As soon as you put some boundaries, plane waves are not longer modes of the electromagnetic field, there will be other type of uh, waves that are modes, OK? Good. So if you do this exercise here, you could do that, find the modes, and then once you have the electromagnetic field modes, you can quantize them very easily using canonical quantum, canonical quantization. And then you could find something such as that the electric field operator be precise, the transverse component of the electromagnetic field operator as a function of x can always be written as a sum over all the possible modes that exist in such a resonator, which typically you can write in this form. There is I epsilon, which is the polarization, then there is as emission conjugate, OK? This means electric field operator I can always write as a sum of mode indices. Here, in this case, the polarization, the two pos potential transverse polarizations, and n, which labels uh, the, the level in your discrete spectrum that you have in the presence of boundary conditions. Then there is the annihilation operation op uh, for the mode n, OK? Then some mode function, which for a Two mirrors is kind of a sinus, 
like the modes of a, of, a, of a rope with fixed boundary conditions that you always have a sinus. And then basically labels a number of nodes that you have in this mode. Okay. And some prefactor. And this prefactor is always h bar uh, omega n divided the volume of the cavity. Okay. So here, uh, basically, I use all this notation. So basically, and that's why I say always that these modes are just harmonic oscillators, because now these modes n fulfill the, fulfill the commutation rules of harmonic oscillators. This kn is the wave number associated associated to the mode n, which has a wave number n pi over l, where the minimum wave number is 1. So it's n equal to 1. And an omega n is just the frequency associated to that mode. And b is the cavity volume. Okay, Which is basically of the order of l times some area, which is somehow the area associated to these mirrors or the area associated to this beam in cylindrical coordinates, okay? So two comments about that. First of all, the smaller the L, the smaller the cavity, the larger this value will be. So which means that for the same kind of excitations, the larger the electromagnetic field will be. And this is important. For some experiments, you want small cavities to make sure that these fluctuations have very strong magnetic electric fields that couple maybe then with other systems. And second, there are, in principle, different modes in this cavity, okay? different harmonic oscillators. So what, uh, let me, I, I use two minutes and then we stop, okay? So then what is important is there are many modes, and these modes, you see, because they are confined in a space, they have different frequencies. And the difference in frequencies between two consecutive modes can be calculated as follows. So the difference in frequency between two consecutive modes, okay, n plus 1 and minus the frequency of mode n, is just given by pi c over l. And this is called the so-called free spectral range of the, of the electromagnetic field resonator. So this means that if, if the cavity is sufficiently small, these modes are very well separated in energies. And if they are very well separated in frequencies, then as soon as you put another system that is somehow coupled to the resonator, what will typically happen is that this other system will only excite one of these modes, not the other ones. Okay? So if the free spectral, uh, uh, sorry, free, free spectral range is larger than any other uh, frequency in the system, then typically what will matter is one mode, okay? So the, mo the system will, or in our case in optomechanics, the mechanical motion will only couple to one mode of all this n, okay? So basically, this allows me to, to, to consider the cavity as made by a single mode, okay? So this is, if you want, called the single mode approximation or the single mode assumption. You should make sure your system is such that it fulfills that, that it only couples to a single mode, which is easy, not so hard to fulfill, to be honest. But uh, and single mode approximation. More than, yeah. And then basically the cavity fill operator as a function of x, then can be just approximated by some particular mode, which we will call the cavity mode, which will have the frequency that is the one coupling to the other degrees of freedom we are interested in. It might have some polarization, the one you're coupling to. Plus the harmonic conjugate. Okay. And hence, now the dynamics of the electromagnetic field mode in the absence of any interaction is just given by a nice harmonic oscillator, 
which I use the now the label A. Okay. So that's then the idea. In optomechanics, now I introduce the two modes. The mechanical mode, which was very easy to define, just the mechanical motion of something, which is an harmonic oscillator, which has a frequency omega m, and uh, which I said is typically at the scale of megahertz, and I use the symbol b. Then there is the optical mode, or the electromagnetic field mode, which is typically you solve Maxwell equations in some, with some boundaries, then you find solutions of the electromagnetic field which are oscillating with a single frequency. These solutions are very separated in energies, so I can always focus on to one of those, one mode, which will be the relevant one, and I call this mode the cavity mode, and has associated a frequency omega c, which will be, if it's optical, it's 10 to the 15, if it's microwave, it's 10 to the 10, and it will be just a single oscillator with frequency a. Okay, now after the break, we will build the third relevant term, which is how these two modes couple. Okay? Questions about this? Yeah? Uh, what tends to zero? L. Yeah, L tends to zero, which means that then uh, the frequencies are very well separated, and then if L would be so small, so small, so small, the, lo the ground state mode would, be, would have an energy uh, pi C over L, and if you would make L, L, L very small, this frequency will be so large, so large, so large, that it's not optical anymore, and if it's not optical anymore, physically the mirrors will not be mirrors anymore, will be transparent, and there will be no cavity. But perfect, but um, a mirror, so a mirror has, so a mirror, uh, so the properties of a material, so the properties of how the electromagnetic field interacts with the material depend very much on the frequency of this field. So a mirror is a mirror for visible light, but it's not a mirror for uh, X-rays. If we would have a mirror for X-rays, if you make it even smaller, then it will not be a, a mirror for ultra, uh, for uh, gamma rays. <laughs> there are no, the point is there are no mirrors for, uh, for uh, 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 very broad range of frequencies, unfortunately. We don't have any material that is a mirror for very broad range of frequencies. Yeah. That, did I answer? The field? The flu not the field, the fluctuations of the field. So, but you see, to... Okay, I, I know where you are going, but so the point is, this, this is the constant in front of A. Then you would, you would need to be able to prepare the state of the electromagnetic field in, an, in a non-vacuum state. And of course, if the cavity is very small, uh, you might need a lot of energy to excite such a photon. No. But yeah, in principle. But of course, you have to be careful. This limit, theoretically, it's not consistent with assumptions of your theory. The assumptions of your theory, aside that, you don't, you are not able, so you don't consider very highly energetic electromagnetic fields, because if they are very highly energetic, they would excite electrons to speeds comparable to the speed of light, and then you should consider charges relativistically, which we are not doing in quantum optics. So also, the, to be consistent with your theory, you should always put a cutoff to the energy of your electromagnetic field. Okay. And uh, I think there is now a 30 minutes uh, break, and then we continue. <laughs>